you to religious or any way. I'm not knocking your religion. I'm going to say things that some people are religious that might hurt your feelings. I'm not attacking the religion. I'm attacking the individuals who may have gone into that religion and caused damage. So don't please don't assume I'm doing anything like that. Okay. Now, up until about the 6th century BCE in Persia, the world was essentially polytheistic, which meant that there was all kinds of gods. There was gods for trees, gods for the sky, there was gods for stones, gods for rivers. The world was saturated with gods and goddesses for everything. There was no idea of monotheism of <coughs> one god. Then the most, one of the most significant points in human history came along when a Persian poet, a prophet called Zarathustra, and this religion still exists today, believe it or not, came up with the idea of dualism and suddenly the world changed very differently from this point on. This is one of the most significant events in human history, as significant as the Industrial Revolution. What happened then was, reality was divided into two things, good and evil. Okay? God was good, and some kind of evil force, like a devil or a Satan, was evil. Therefore, you had two teams you had to pick from. Are you with this side of good or with the side of evil? Now that may seem, okay, that makes sense at the beginning, but as we'll find out through history, the parameters between good and evil are very flexible. One person's evil may be another person's good. One person's good may be another person's evil, depending on where you're coming on. If my religion states that your religion is evil, are you evil? No, you're not evil. That's just me and my dogma imposing this upon you. And what do we have in the space between this flexible idea of good and good and evil? <coughs> That's where the psychopath flourishes. Because all the psychopath has to do then is explain what evil is, what good is, and declare you either on his side or on the side of evil. This is where I believe it all went wrong. Because Zoroastrianism, although dualism by itself is actually a good thing, but when it's applied to the idea of monotheism, it can be a very dangerous thing. One god, one president, one king, one rule book, one creed. You're on our side, or you're evil, or you'll be destroyed. This is when we went downhill. Dualism by itself, the idea that the universe or reality is composed of opposites makes perfect sense. Male, female, up, down, positive, negative. Great, that's all perfect sense. And the Neoplatonists and Jews that came later on, other groups I will show you, actually use this idea for very good things. But unfortunately, monotheism, as Gore Vidal calls, the greatest disaster that ever afflicted human Western civilization was the creation of monotheism. The idea of one God. That's what went wrong. Because once you have it's always going to be as your God is the best God. And what happens then is, when you have the almighty God in the sky, that gives you the divine right of kings, or God's representative on earth. Perfect for the psychopath. And so, with Sarawastrism, he meant well, probably, but if that was what happened, we have a division between the world just split into a horror show. And it's been like this ever since. And hopefully the day will come in the future where we can compare this line back again. We don't have to believe in polytheism. We can believe in nothing we want. Once we get out of this idea of good and evil. Even polytheism was interesting in classical Greece. It's even been speculated by some scholars that classical Greece went into decline when they took the gods from the earth remember like from Mount Olympus and place them in the stars as constellations because when the gods were around you you had a more of a, an, an intimate relationship with spirituality more inter, intimate relationship at there was a god of the trees you had an intimate relationship with trees go to the forest you felt it but once the god was in the sky what do you need between the god in the sky and the person on the earth the middleman and who's often the middleman the psychopath let's talk about this is something so I'm very, very interested in. I think all of you would be interested if you knew about this stuff. Again, they don't teach us this and stuff in school. <clears throat> the Gnostics were the guys who, after the Council of Nicaea, said, uh-uh, 
no way are we going with the Roman church. You cannot leave out many of the t- these texts. They're far too important and they're far too powerful and they're far too meaningful and they should never have been left out. So the Gnostics developed as a kind of an alternative Christianity and they flourished very much in Egypt. In Egypt they were very big, but they were also big in, the, in Palestine and that part of the world. Now, in 1947, the same year the Dead Sea Scrolls, you've all heard of them, were found, a document, a very par- important document called the Nag Hammadi text was found. The Nag Hammadi text was very significant, even more significant than the Dead Sea Scrolls because it showed how all our history from this point on had been manipulated and changed and rewritten. When you go back to the old stuff, you get the full story. So this document was nearly 2,000 years old. I think it was a couple, a couple of hundred years after Jesus. There was nothing between this and today that would have been changed by the Pope or would have been changed by any, any other theologian, Martin Luther or anyone else. So you get, the, you get the, the real story as it was back in those days. Then. It hasn't been rewritten by scholars or rechanged by propaganda. This document is so significant that it explained the Gnostic view of the world. The Gnostics were a dualist cult, like I said before. They believed in the duality of the universe. However, they believed that the earth was a living creature called Gaia, Sophia Gaia. They believed the earth was alive and it was actually a living creature. And that was God. And it was a female. And they didn't believe in the sanctity the divinity of Jesus. They said that Jesus was just a... a, a, a a great guy, had some great ideas, but he wasn't the son of God. That's, a, that's an amazing thing to say, to call someone the son of God. He was just a guy who had some great ideas, he was reforming Judaism, and uh, they killed him for it. But he wasn't the son of God, he said he was just a great guy, okay, that's how he saw him. But the earth was a living creature called Sophia Gaia, so it was a mixture of Greek and Christian, Christian thought. In this Nag Hammadi text, they had this, there was a a very early draft of Plato's The Republic. Plato's The Republic is a very significant book because it basically lays out by Plato how to control the human race. And he talks about, although I'm not putting down Plato's a clever guy in many ways, but he, you know, he was very dark in how he said a society should be run. If there's too many people living on, in a certain region, you start a war, you kill off the men, that kind of thing. And that's very psychopathic. And he also... Uh, was very much obsessed with the idea of social control and social engineering. And that's why Plato has become such a such an important figure for the elites and the universities to this day. But this in, in this they spoke about these things called the Archons. Now the Archon the word Archon means Lord in Greek or ruler. Okay? Now there's a there's a guy called John Lash and I've done a few radio interviews with him. And he speculates that the, now we both agree that somehow the archons have something to do with the psychopaths. Okay, but he speculates that they're a kind of a, a non-organic human form <coughs> that kind of enters the human mind like a parasite and takes them over, like an alien, but not an alien from another planet, like an alien that exists, another human, another kind of conscious outside us. I disagree with that. Uh, I, I, I just say he could be right. I don't know, but my my theory is I think what the archons are talking when, the, when the, what the Gnostics are talking about archons is that they are talking about bureaucratic, cold-blooded, psychopathic structures because they describe the archons as having no feelings, devoid of personality, and they're rulers. And you talk about the centres where archons flourish, and they're generally capitals: Jerusalem, Alexandria, places where you would have your Babylon places where you would have bureaucratic structures and they were they would this was their, the archon was their word for saying the psychopaths in control these ones who have no feelings they push their laws through they have no respect for anyone they, it's, it's their way or nobody's way and so that's my theory that the, that's what they were talking about the archons and this Nag Hammadi scripture is filled with this stuff very deep very heavy this was probably the first time that anyone in history in my opinion wrote about psychopaths. They didn't use the term psychopaths, but they were aware that there were certain types of human beings with a very different life view, and they were in positions of power. 
in the major cities and they were the ones who were causing all the problems and they were the ones enforcing imperial doctrine of Christianity that the official version through Constantine and through the Roman imperial structure and the Archons were probably the guys who were pushing that cold-blooded bureaucrats today we would just call them like the ones in the, the, the spooks inside government offices who pass these draconian laws and taxes and they're not responsible for anything because they're not elected officials we don't know their names they're bureaucrats the Gnostics called them archons and clues are left through history one of the things that the archons uh, sorry that the Gnostics believed and uh, if anyone's a Christian I'm don't, this is what they believe it's not what I'm saying this might offend some people Okay. But they believe that there, was, there really was a God. That's what this, is what this document tells us, the previous one. There really was a God. Okay, And he did create the world. Sophia got it, right? But there was a thing called Yahweh or Jehovah, which they believed was a psychopathic demon, which was pretending to be God. You understand? And taking the credit for the creation of the world. And he... This, this Yahweh or Jehovah was the one who wanted sacrifice, who wanted who caused all the horrors in the Old Testament. So they, 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 they rejected that completely. And there are things that show up now and again that will kind of show this. This is an older Bible I have at home. And I said to myself one day, this is before I knew this stuff, I'm going to write, write, read the Bible from beginning to end. Because we always hear of that, but no one ever reads it. And so I just began reading the Bible and I found it very interesting. Right from the very beginning you have Genesis and this talks about the creation of the universe. And it talks about, you know, there was a God and God did this and God did this and God blessed the firm and God created man. Blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly we get passed down here to where God, and it just says God, one word, G-O-D, and God did this and then God creates man and woman. And then suddenly, and then... The Jehovah God. And I went, uh oh, who's this guy? We had God here, and suddenly this, this dude shows it, the Jehovah God. And this is exactly what the Gnostics had said that there was a God, and he created the universe, and up as far as man. And then something happened where this guy called Jehovah jumped in and said, hey, I'm God, not him, I'm God. And I want you to sacrifice for me, I want you to kill any of my enemies. I want men, I want women to be, to be men, to not have the same power as men. Gnostics did not believe in that. I want, uh, I want women to have their rights taken away. Man is superior. I want sacrifice. Animal, I want you killing animals is my name. I want you killing enemies in my name. And this is what the Gnostics believed. And they believed that Jesus Christ, well I'll talk about that a bit later on. And the Gnostics became a kind of an underground sect. They probably existed in the last mention of them in Italy about the 1500s. But they were basically a hidden a hidden group. They had to lay on the ground. Because wherever they were found, they were butchered and murdered and slaughtered. Just if you, to be in, there's, you'd be, along with Jews, there's been no group in history that has been so oppressed and murdered and suffered genocide as the Gnostics. They were completely wiped out. And they used to these coded symbols, and now we're getting into other things of code. Why did codes develop? Why did espionage develop? It often developed to protect people who were in they had powerful information that could undermine the system. And this is from an old Kabbalistic text. This is Kabbalistic Kabbalism, the Jewish mysticism, and the Gnostic were very heavily involved in that. And this is called the sign of benediction and malediction to show you that the Pope, when he's, you know, the Pope, he makes the sign of of benediction, this kind of thing it looks like a scale of boy scouts on her. If you cast light on that, a shadow appears in the devil. And that's what they were saying the real Jehovah God was. There's, that's the duality. They were saying that behind this whole like the yin and yang thing and all that, there's good and evil. And the Gnostics were trying to put this through, but they said whenever the sign of benediction is given, if, it's, if a light is shined upon it, it shows a devil head in the shadow. And you can see that there, the two horns, and that's where our devil came from. And that was a sign of malediction. And this is, because, this is where codes and people who went underground and 
hid from the system to try and stay alive, developed codes and symbols. And this is where Freemasonry and other things like that came from. And even espionage came from that. Became, this is when they discovered that it was no use saying, I don't believe anymore, because they'd crucify you or they'd burn you. So people said, let's get organized, develop codes and secrets, get on the ground and try and hold the knowledge. And this is what we're going to find happens. What we find happens is, when the control structure is, is evil, dangerous, cruel, tyrannical, that there's a, re a reaction to it. And back then, because of the nature of the world and how the world operated, these people called the Gnostics became the repository of the hidden knowledge. That's what the word Gnostics means. It means knowledge, Gnosis, knowledge. But the Romans used to call them Gnostics, like, uh, Gnostics, meaning like a bunch of know-it-alls. They think they know it all. And that's the same way they talk about conspiracy theorists today. Bloody conspiracy theorists, bunch of nuts. And that's how they used to speak about the, the Gnostics. Bunch of, bunch of Gnostics, know-it-all. They think they know it all. They're all full of it. And yet the Nag Hammadi text appears all these centuries later to show that they were telling the truth, that they were right. So it always comes true somehow. And this we'll see this, this theme developing now. As the control control structure became more pathological, there was a revulsion or a reaction to it that developed good things for humanity. And the earliest version of that was the Gnostics. The Gnostics. But to, to, I want you to go home and start reading about the Gnostics because it's a very, very interesting history. And we're, again, were any of us told about this in school? Okay, this is my current very big interest, the Cathars. Now, a lot of people don't realize that at one time in the 12th century, Christianity was really in danger of being just finished. It was on its last leg. This kind of, it, this goes back to the Gnostics a bit. There was, a, a, there was a, a sect that began probably out of Persia, but it shows up in the 9th century, the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th century in, Yugosla in uh, Yugoslavia, Bosnia, Bulgaria area. And they were called the Bogomils. And they had a dualistic view of the universe, but again, in a healthy way. They weren't obsessed with good and evil. They just had a dualistic view of the universe. Of the universe. And this spread across Europe. Now people, one of the reason, interesting reasons is like a lot of Eastern people didn't like Christianity. That's why Bosnia became Muslim because as soon as the Ottomans invaded and they said what religion are you and they said well we're not we're not Catholics and he says okay we'll sign up they did most Europeans did not want to be Catholics giving a choice at those times or even Christian because they associated with the horrors of Rome you see the two things were inseparable the Roman Empire and its barbarity and its totalitarianism and Christianity were seen as the same thing. Now, we don't see it like that today, but it was. We would put ourselves into the people in Europe at that time. That's how they saw it. So this, this spread across through the Balkans, this, this boat mills, into Italy, and kind of settled as a sect that could show up in southern France, a bit of Italy, and a bit of, a bit of Spain, northern Spain, very northern Italy, called the Cathars. Incredible people. At a time when, or talking about the Middle Ages, the most oppressive period in the history of Christianity, where people were told they were damned, where you had things like plenary indulgences, where you had to pay money to get to your local bishop to get into heaven, these kinds of things, right? Suddenly a religion shows up that says the same thing the Gnostic says, that the Bible, the Old Testament, was written by this, this, the devil. That's what they call them, the devil or Satan, right? Jesus Christ was came along to reform it. They were the only book they believed in was the New Testament, and they believed very much in the idea of Jesus' message for humanity. Being kind to others, love your enemies. You know, let, let's just be nice to each other. They believed in that. Now, when these people presented this message to serfs and poor people in southern France in the Middle Ages, it sounded fantastic. You didn't have to worry about paying the local bishop to get to heaven. You didn't have to worry about the Ten Commandments. You d because you didn't have to worry about going to hell. You know why? Because you already live in hell and it's called the planet Earth. 
And that's what the Cathars believed, that this was hell. This was hell here. This was the lowest you could go, and we're already there. And it ain't so bad now and again, because you can get women, and you can get wine, and you can have parties and festivals. It's not so bad. It's bad when things go wrong, but while we're in hell, let's make hell fun. This is literally how they thought. They only had one sacrament, and it was called the consolatum. Consolamentum, consolamentum. One sacrament is all they had. Compared to Catholicism, where you had prayers, sacraments, and all kinds of rituals for everything, they only had one. And the one was that at the end of your life, if you wanted to give up your earthly body and become a spirit, you could do it. Or you had the choice of coming back to earth and being reincarnated. Imagine that. A European Christian sect that believed in reincarnation. And many chose to come back to earth because they didn't feel that they felt that they had completed their mission the first time round. Others would be ready to take the consolamentum and give up their human body. It was a one-way ticket. Go to and become a spirit. Okay. So this was fantastic to European peasants. No pope, no rules. All we have to do is be kind, nice to each other. And what happened was this culture flourished like you would not believe economically incredibly powerful because they had a great belief in trades, skills, and guilds, crafts, craftspeople. They gave equal rights to men and women. A woman in 11th century France had the same property rights as a man, something that didn't happen again until de Gaulle was president in the 1940s. Just think about that. In the Middle Ages, we're talking about now, women could become what they called perfects, which was the priest class of the Cathars, both men and women. They didn't have churches. They didn't have bishops. They didn't have anything like that. They had, used to meet in people's houses. They would meet in clubs. They would meet in barns. And they would discuss how do we live a good life like Jesus. Okay? They were highly respected by everyone that knew them. More importantly, when regions of France where Cathars were in control and they became incredibly powerful at one time because they were economically powerful. Not only did they have the best cities, the least problems, uh, the best roads and so on, best bridges, best castles, best buildings. But Jews, Muslims and Catholics lived in, pre in freedom under the Cathars and had no problems being worried about being oppressed. In fact, Jews and Muslims were often welcomed into the highest positions of their government. In their, in their town councils. They did not believe in marriage. They believed that marriage was another scam to make women prisoners. What they believed that a man and a woman, if they wanted to get married and have kids, they should do it in a kind of a civil ceremony. But they didn't do it with a priest. And what happened then was that priests were, were completely unemployed all over part, huge sections of France. Catholic priests now, okay? And they were lazy. And they would sit around getting money from Rome and they had nothing to do because they would sit in these these, these great cathedrals and churches and there was no money there was no no, no uh, parishioners coming in and there was, a, there was an expression in a uh, and they were also seen as devious and they were also seen as greedy and that's why they became priests and uh, there was an expression the Cathars had if you, if you accused the Cathar of cheating he'd go what do you take me for a priest and that's how <laughs> that's how low they held the Catholic church in a uh, in a uh, in contempt. And what happened then was, well, the, the Pope heard about this. We're talking about, by the, the end of the 11th century, millions of them. It, it threatened Christianity completely. It was called the greatest heresy, but it really was the true Christianity. When you think about it. it just believed in kindness and decency and, all, and the work of Jesus. They only had one book, the Old Testament, and that was it. And they didn't have revelations, just the Old Testament. And so... These people were very well liked by everyone that knew them. In fact, many Catholic dukes would protect them. And so the Pope sent out messages saying, you teach these Cathars a lesson. And so many Catholic leaders and even some Catholic bishops like St. Bernard said, no, these people are completely okay. They're nice people. They're, and they even called them good Christians. They're actually better than Christians. And they would not, they would not pick on them. So the local... Catholic powerful forces where the, the Cathars lived refused to have there was two reasons for this these guys could fight these guys see the, although the perfects were vegetarians 
the regular classes could eat meat. So, and they were superb fighters. They had excellent defences, excellent weapons. They, they, were not, they were not hippies. These guys could fight, right? They were challenged. That was one reason. These guys were aware how, these guys, how tough these guys were. And they would fight for their, their people, but they would also fight for other people that were oppressed. So the Catholics and the, the Jews and the Muslims said, we're not going, well, you, you leave, us alone, leave those Cathars alone, they're nice people. They don't bother anybody. So Pope Innocent, ironically, the third. If you ask any person today, when did the, 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 the Inquisition begin? They'll always tell you it's during the Protestant Reformation. No, the Inquisition began in the 1100s, hundreds of years earlier. And their first target was, not Muslims, but the Cathars. Pope Innocent was so worried about Catholicism being destroyed, or not being destroyed, but being made irrelevant by the Cathars, that he organised the very first crusade in history. And here we go, the very first genocide in history. The first genocide, sorry, in Europe, the first genocide in Europe took place in France in the 11 and 1200s. So what happened was, the first, they organised the first crusade, and just like the later crusades against Islam, in the Middle East, he, the Crusades were what, where they recruited psychopaths. The Crusaders were psychopaths. They weren't noble warriors. Because what would happen was, if you, design, if you joined a Crusade, you were absolved of all your sins. So that means if you were a murderer or a thief, you still went to heaven. But they didn't care about that because civil law and clerical law, classical law, was the same thing at those times. So therefore, you'd be absolved of all your crimes, no matter what they were. So you Secondly, you got to get any of the land you conquered and any of the property you conquered. And these people had fabulous farms, vineyards, <coughs> castles, and a higher standard of living <coughs> any, above it or anything else in Europe. So kill a few Cathars and you take his farm, you're set. So the, the Crusades were totally and completely designed to get psychopaths to sign up. And there's a guy called the Monk, the first ones that went in, the, the, the Cathars kicked their asses. They had no problem holding them back. They had phenomenal defences and cities. And they still exist to this day in southern France. However, they started to attack the smaller villages. And then they, this is when it gets really horrible. These people believed, as I said earlier on, that this was hell. And in the year 1210, that actually became true. Because the Pope said, show unbelievable cruelty teach the rest of them and frighten them. You will be resolved of all your sins. And one of the first major battles that was lost in Brown, a hundred Cathar prisoners had their noses chopped and their lips cut off and blinded. And one was left with one eyesight so they could all hold each other's shoulders and walk to the next Cathar village. This was the direct order from the bishops, by the way. As a measure of God's mercy, he was left one eye. One of them was left an eye. To go to the next village to show the rest of them, this is what's going to happen to all of you. What do we have now? Propaganda. Propaganda and fear. Psychopaths would only think of this. And these people, who everyone liked, who had a pretty cool religion, who didn't bother anyone, were completely and totally annihilated. Maybe over a million of them. And then they were wiped off the face of earth. And then later, groups like the Jesuits wrote histories about them, calling them <coughs> sinners, sodomites, <coughs> cruel to animals, cruel to children, crazy people, and all this stuff. And if you, you ask a Jesuit, even today, about the Cathars, he'd say that was an awful religion. They didn't even believe in going, in going to heaven or anything. And they didn't give the people any hope. But that's all their lies. That was propaganda by the Jesuits and the, and, and the Inquisition. But this was... The, this is what happened after the psychopaths took over. The first group in history that kind of went, to, let's, let's get back to what it's like to be a good human being again. And because it was so dangerous to the control structure, they wiped these people off the face of the earth in the 1200s. And this is, this is another one you have to, I want you to learn about when you go about. St. Dominic, Dominic was one of the, Pope Innocent was the main psychopath who started this. But St. Dominic of the Dominican order, still a, still a big Catholic order today, was the one who devised the means to wipe them out and all the cruelty. He first, he first went there and he charged them with 
you know, all kinds of heresy, which wasn't true. They weren't heretical. They just believed that the Old Testament was written by the devil. That's it. And another one is they also, when St. Dominic said to them at a council of Cathar elders, why do you not worship Christ on the cross? You know, they, 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 they were fan of Jesus. They didn't worship the crucifixion. And they said that, uh, because would you worship the gallows that your father was hung upon? Interesting point. Because what they were saying then was Catholicism was a debt cult. It wasn't interested in the life of Jesus. It was interested in the death of Jesus. Middle age Catholicism. And it took hundreds of years for Catholicism to fix. And to get back together again. These people were... If, I often wonder if that had to become the mainstream religion of Europe. Would we have avoided so much of the things, backward things that happened? Yeah, I mean, it's only speculation. But you wonder, would we be flying an aircraft by the 1500s? Would we be sending rockets to the moon by the 1700s? You know, we would have avoided all the Inquisition. We would have avoided so much, so much misery and so much backwardness in Europe if these people had to become the dominant sect, especially their relationship in terms of cohabitation with other religions. They had no problem with Islam, where the Catholic Church had a huge problem with Islam. They had no problem with Jews. But this, this, this genocide of the Cathars was so successful that it gave them the psychopaths in control one more tool they could use. Terror, genocide, oppression, just business. After the Middle Ages, something happened and human beings started to look at things differently. Particularly, and we're going to talk about this tomorrow night, where suddenly people within the elite started to express their humanity and human decency in their own kind of way. And we're going to talk about some of these things. Now, some of these things went wrong, but they, you, you, human, being, human, human history in Europe reached rock bottom just after the, just at the late Middle Ages, right before the Renaissance. Just went to pieces. Horrible, okay? And now, tomorrow, that's what I've taken you for tonight, so we've, we've now gone into the gates of hell. We're at, the very, we're at the very bottom of the things. We're at the very bottom now, okay? Now, at this point in history, things will start to come out. You know, so we're looking, going to look at it this way. Although horrors are still to come, the hope starts coming in. And it started to come through, in, first of all, in art, among the cultures, who started to realise there are other human beings on this planet who are not the same as us, but they did it through this kind of thing. And then after this, they started to come up with the ideas of dealing with it. And it's almost like, you know, I'm, my attitude to teaching about psychopathology is that, okay, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a scientific thing. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a psychological thing. It's a practical thing. It's a political, social thing. But maybe there's a spiritual aspect to it as well. Maybe the human race is on a kind of a spiritual journey where we were create, where this idea of evil manifested amongst us, caused us chaos, created duality, split us apart, made us imbalanced, left brain, right brain, made us forget about our spiritual nature of such things, or even working on our consciousness, handing our spirituality, our consciousness development over to leaders. Maybe we had the lesson to learn is that we have to be responsible for our own lives and our own behavior. And part of that is coming to terms with the fact that not all humans are the same. So we're finished now, right? So good night and I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks very much. Yeah.